to this session. Uh, my name is Nicolas Dumonte, and uh, we are together uh, this afternoon with Laura Sanchez, uh, Rona Rajani, Nico Piazza. And uh, we are here with you also, uh, most important to share our experience, uh, to discuss, and finally, hopefully, to learn something about transcatheter mitral valve replacement. And to be more precise, what we would like to do during the next 50, uh, 60 minutes is to focus more on the pre-procedural imaging, the new imaging modality that can help us in the planning of our procedures and also in the guidance of our procedure and hopefully uh, uh, in order to improve the outcomes for our patients. So this will be our topic and our focus uh, this afternoon. Uh, but m before to start, maybe, Nico, you, you want to say a few words about the interaction mode? Yeah, sure. So as Nicola was saying that, you know, the most important piece of this puzzle is the audience and the participants. So we really like you to interact um, either with us or um, amongst yourselves or even with the operators. Um, and you can do that a number of ways. You can use the app. Uh, we have a, a chat master, um, and you can also uh, use the microphones that are located at the posterior aspects of the room. Thank you, Nico. So, as you will see, um, we have built this session around the clinical case and real, uh, real life experiences and, uh, and cases. So, I propose maybe we, with you, that we, we start with a, a case that we've recorded in, uh, in Clinic Pasteur a few days ago. Uh, and it's about a patient, quite old, 89-year-old woman, who was recently hospita hospitalized for a decompensated heart failure related to a severe intraprostatic mitral regurgitation in a degenerated mitral bioprosthesis. So as usual, with such uh, elderly and old lady, first thing we, we checked was the, the cognitive function, the vital status, the geriatrician ev evaluation, that was good. And as you see, this patient has an old and important uh, um, history of uh, mitral surgery. Uh, 1989 surgical mitral valve replacement with a mechanical uh, prosthesis after anocarditis. And in 2011, reduced surgical mitral valve replacement with the current one, the Medtronic Mosaic. She was also later on implanted with a dual, dual chamber pacemaker and had the year after a uh, transient ischemic attack. So currently, as you, as you see, this patient is quite small, frail, but not too severe uh, frail. Uh, as I said, with a favorable geriatrician assessment, she's still in sinus rhythm. Uh, on the laboratory investigation, nothing remarkable except some degree of uh, chronic kidney disease. And you see here the medication, why, that is quite standard, but important to mention that this patient is still symptomatic despite this uh, uh, level of uh, diuretics. Let's keep maybe very briefly this transthoracic and trans echography because we will have more details afterwards. But as I mentioned, this patient is suffering from a severe mitral regurgitation that is strictly intraprostatic. Uh, and a recurrence of endocarditis has been uh, ruled out. Uh, Periprostatic regurgitation also. The mechanism is a cusp prolapse. It's no stenotic. Uh, the LV function is more or less preserved with such degree of uh, MR and no over significant valvular heart disease, no significant pulmonary hypertension. So after that round of uh, uh, assessment, we, have, uh, we had a preliminary uh, round discussion within the heart team. And obviously, I would say, and I would say you, you, would, you would agree, huh? and everybody would agree, considering the past history of this patient, we first considered the feasibility of transcatheter mitral valve in valve procedure. And that led us to the uh, cardiac CT analysis that is, I think, the crucial part. And that's where I think, Ronak, you, you can give, give us more insights. OK, so thanks very much, Nick and Nico. A fascinating case of a patient who's had two prior surgical mitral valve replacements. And the question that's been posed to me, um, and I didn't know the clinical details before looking at the cardiac CT, is as to whether or not this patient is suitable for a valve-in-valve -valve mitral procedure. So these are my conflicts of interest. So what I anticipate to do is I'm going to take you through the standard CT read, as I would use, um, and then give you some thoughts from reviewing the CT data set. And then uh, the plan will be to show you an advanced CT analysis 
to really hone in as to whether or not this patient is suitable or not. So let's first of all look at this cardiac CT data set. So my compliments to ne Nico and uh, Nick, uh, very good quality CT data set. And we can already realize that this patient has a left-sided pleural effusion and also has a dual chamber pacemaker in situ. Now when we're focusing in on the mitral valve, the important thing is to place your crosshairs over the sewing ring of the mitral valve prosthesis. Now if you focus your eyes on the top left hand plane, you can see that I'm scrolling through the image and making a few minor rotations to position the crosshairs at the sewing ring of the mitral valve prosthesis. I now do this for the bottom right hand image so that this is performed in two orthogonal planes. We can already tell that this is a Medtronic mosaic valve by the, by the three fluoroscopic markers at the stent post rims. Now we're now tracking through the internal annulus dimensions and we can see that the annulus area or the sewing ring diameter is 514 millimeters squared. Now for the purposes of this case, what I also do is just to do a freehand tool because this enables me to virtually implant a, a further valve to look for suitability. Now it's very difficult to know on that imaging alone whether or not this patient is suitable for a valve in valve procedure. So we're now going to move to my preferred platform for analysis, which is the materialized software. And the first step in this process is to look at the landing zone and also to measure the automated segmentation of the sewing ring of the Medtronic mosaic prosthesis. So by automatic extraction, we can now measure the area of the sewing ring of the Medtronic mitral valve. And this is the starting point of the analysis, whether you're doing this manually or using a semi-automated process. Now using the 3D image, we can now manually adjust to make sure that we're in the right plane. And once this is done, we can delineate the aortic cusps into the base of the right, the left, and the non-coronary cusps. And this enables us to get the aortomitral angulation. Now you can see that using semi-automated processing software makes this whole procedure very quick and very swift. Now once we've got all of our aortomitral angulation and we also have the sewing ring or the implantation zone, we can now virtually implant a device of any type that we wish to. So in this case, I've elected to use a 29 millimeter Sapien 3, anticipating uh, that Nick would probably want to oversize the valve to avoid patient prosthesis mismatch. But you can also adjust for a 26 and 29 millimeter valve and see what impact this has on the neoleventricular outflow tract area. Now using the semi-automated algorithm, we can see uh, what impact the varying height of deployment has on the neoleventricular outflow tract area. Now knowing that the sapien valve is going to be implanted in the opposite position to how you would implant it in the aortic region, you want to make sure that about 20% to 15% is atrially placed with about 70 to 85% ventricularly placed for this type of valve. And so we can adjust the height, we can adjust the translocation and also the angulation of the device and look at the impact that this will have on the neoleventricular outflow tract area. Now this is particularly important because we do recognize that there is a degree of uncertainty as to what the interventional cardiologist is able to control at the time of the interventional procedure. So when deriving neoleventricular outflow tract areas, you want to make sure that you incorporate a margin of error in terms of deployment zone, height, and also angulation. Now the second part of the analysis is to evaluate the transeptal puncture zone. So what we're going to do is to delineate the phosphorovalis or the anticipated uh, puncture zone and thereafter look at the IVC zone. Now by marking out the IVC zone and the phosphorovalis, we can measure the height from the IVC to the center of the right atrium, the crossing point into the phosphorovalis and the height from the crossing point in the center of the atrium down onto the mitral valve prosthesis. Now from this, uh, once we've segmented and implanted the virtual valve, we're thereafter able to look at the appropriate fluoroscopic angles. Now the next step of this procedure is going to be generating the report and all of these measurements and steps that we've performed in the last few minutes can be exported onto a report so it's easily available for your interventional cardiologists to review the data set in conjunction with the heart team and then to formulate a plan moving forward. So let's now look at the summary findings. We can see that this patient's valve area or the sewing ring area is in excess of 500. That's going to give us uh, probably a 29 millimeter Sapien 3. We can look at the implantation zone, both in systole and diastole. Important to compare both because the LV will be dynamic in nature and to make sure that you are using the smallest neoleventricular outflow tract area. Take some images from the left atrial aspect. You can also rotate it around and look at the left ventricular aspect. And thereafter, look at the derived neoleventricular outflow tract area. 
Now, we also have to bear in mind that one thing that some software doesn't do is it doesn't incorporate the tissue properties of the expanded valve. So my one word of note is that when you are planning for transcatheter mitral in valve procedures, anticipate that there is likely to be some flaring of the device following deployment and that this may impact upon your neo-left ventricular outflow tract area. Here you can see the point that I've previously made that actually the height of deployment does influence the neo-left ventricular outflow tract area and always important to offer your interventional cardiologist the appropriate fluoroscopic angles. So we can see here, and just confirming, that you do get uh, different left ventricular volumes in systole and diastole, and that this has a different impact on the neo-left ventricular outflow tract area, whether you're using a systolic measurement or diastolic measurement. For my standard practice and also speed, I generally go for a mid-systolic or end-systolic frame when I'm doing my valve-in-valve -valve, uh, procedural planning steps, because normally we would anticipate that neo-left ventricular outflow tract area will de be dependent, or the smallest, not only in end systole, but also it is highly dependent on the height of deployment. So we're also going to include some of our transeptal puncture measurements, which you see on the screen here. And this provides some anatomical detail for the interventional cardiologist, but it is really a roadmap or a guide. In practicality, the interventional cardiologist in the cardiac cath lab will get the puncture guided by transesophageal echocardiography and also where they're able to get a good puncture point at the time of their procedure. So with that, I'm now going to put this over to the forum. Uh, do we have any questions about what I've shown? Um, and then we've got some interesting cases, and we'll use the questions to guide us on what I show you next. Uh, just as a point, um, just to sort of give you an idea of the anatomy, we do have a 3D model, which I'm very happy to pass around. Um, this is a 3D model of the case that's been segmented from the 3D data set, which actually has quite tissue-like properties. So do have a look, and uh, maybe that will stimulate some comments or questions. Um, can you hear me? Am I yeah, I think so. Yeah. so um, Ronak, there was a question actually about tissue characterization. Uh, we have an online question from um, Ramiz Imini, who asks about, um, you know, how do you deal with uh, tissue being expanded, I assume, of the anterior mitral valve leaflet, uh, beside the stent? Can you simulate if it will make an LVOT impairment? So it, do you measure the length of the anterior mitral valve leaflet? Um, and you do that on echo or CT? Is there a cutoff you use? Uh, how do you approach that? Yeah, no, it, it's an exceptional question. So, I mean, I think this is always a very difficult area. So the neo-left ventricular outflow tract area is going to be impacted upon by a number of different variables. It's going to be impacted upon by the aortomitral angulation. It's going to be impacted upon the, by the anterior mitral valve leaflet length and also the height of deployment. So certainly, if I had a concern about the length of the anterior mitral valve leaflet, then certainly I would measure it. Any sort of leaflet length beyond sort of 15 to 20 millimeters, I would have a concern that that would be displaced towards the anterior septum and that that may impinge uh, and, and result in neo-left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. However, if your starting neo-left ventricular outflow tract area is big, then it's unlikely that this will be a, a significant issue. Once you get to a neo-left ventricular outflow tract area of 250 millimeters squared, then you need to have a higher degree of caution and start to think about whether or not you want to do septal modification procedures prior to the procedure or anterior leaflet laceration with a lampoon device. The other question regarding tissue characterization and looking at expansile properties of how the valve will impact is that we can use some software to look at to see how the impact of flaring will have on neo-left ventricular outflow tract area. The materialized does incorporate finite element modeling, uh, so there is a degree of simulation on that software inbuilt, but also we can also take it to a next level. We can use other industry providers such as FIOPS, which are able to account for tissue expansion and flaring of device and see how that impacts upon the neo-left ventricular outflow tract area. However, in the majority of cases, if you have a large neo-left ventricular outflow tract area, as in this case, I wouldn't be overly concerned and necessarily move to the next step of evaluation. But there are lots of sophisticated tools that can be used. Ron, I thank you. Um, I, I think um, uh, what I would like to hear from you and to understand is uh, how user-friendly is this solution that you, you, you presented. I mean, uh, at the time I, I prepared that, that case, I did my own anal CT analysis, but the, the basic, I would say, average one. And uh, I had, of course, two questions. The sizing, which size of valve should I implant in such patient? And the second was the risk of uh, LVOT obstruction. So 
with the basic tools I had, I tried to have an idea of that, but you showed that uh, with uh, the material as software, you, you were able to provide very, very precise information about that, but is it something that is as fast as you record it uh, regarding the, the, the treatment of the CT scan, or is it something that is really demanding, that needs a, a long learning curve? Yeah, I mean, I think with any transcatheter mitral valve procedure, whether it's a, a native TMVR for severe functional regurgitation, a valve in MAC or a valve in valve or valve in ring, I think the, the onus is on the imaging analyzer to invest the time to make sure that you're providing as much information possible to the interventional cardiologist. So certainly what I've shown you is what my standard practice and approach would be. I would always look through the standard CT data set, you know, Half of my life is spent looking at cardiac CT data sets. The other half of my life is spent at looking at trans, uh, thoracic and transesophageal echo. So the basic overview of the CT scan is relatively quick, and I can get a good idea as to whether or not a patient is suitable for any of those valve in, uh, valve, in valve procedures, valve in MAC procedures, reasonably quickly. The materialized add-on or specific software, I think, is imperative when you are th considering any complicated procedure which does come with a risk or um, you know, there's a risk of neoleftentricular outflow tract obstruction. I think the centers that report good results are those centers that are using sophisticated analyses rather than relying on axial CT data sets. In terms of processing time, so the analysis of this case I would say was probably about eight to 10 minutes uh, for me to do on materialized software, which I think is an acceptable time yeah. frame for the level of complexity of the case and the amount of information that it provides. Ronak, maybe, maybe before we come back to that case, um, you could share with us uh, other experiences from your, your, your library for your cases uh, in other anatomical situations. I mean, here the, the risk of LVOPT obstruction, I would say, was quite minimal regarding the prosthesis, regarding the angulation with uh, the, the automitral angle. But we know that, for example, in MAC cases, we, we have a more complex situation. So can you maybe show us an example on that? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly. I mean, I think the, the valve in MAC cases are certainly probably some of the most complicated analyses to do. So I do have a, a valve in MAC case. Uh, what I will do is to show you a basic analysis, uh, and then I'll put it to Nico and Nick and the team, Laura, whether they would think that this patient is suitable for a valve in MAC case. So you get to hear from the experts on the panel as to what they would do. And then I will show you the analysis on the materialize and what my overall conclusions were. We could even, I suppose, add in an audience vote. So if we could be prepared to pause the screen after the basic CT analysis on the black screen, and I'll show you a valve in MAC case that I was asked to analyze about four or five months ago. Okay, so the first thing is we can clearly see that this is a, a, a gated cardiac CT data set. I'm only showing you the 40% phase. You can see that the patient has some coronary disease, but there is extensive circumferential calcification, not only over the posterior annulus, but also the anterior mitral valve annulus. So the same approach for all TMBR planning procedures, multiplanar reformatting imaging, using your crosshairs and placing it over the mitral valve annulus in two orthogonal planes. Now, one of my top tips for evaluating valve in MAC cases is making sure that you get the rotation right on your crosshairs, but also when doing your measurements, you actually increase your slice width thickness to four to five millimeters, so you can see the circumferentialarity of the actual mitral valve annulus calcification, so you know that you are measuring your perimeter or your area at the most uh, widest calcific zone. So here you can see that I've pulled out the mitral valve annulus calcification, and I'm just tracing around the mitral valve annulus calcification area. Now, a question that came up in the main arena just on the previous session is what do you do about calcium blooming artifact? If we could pause there, please. So with calcium blooming artifact, you know, a lot of people get, I think, a little bit obsessive about where to measure uh, the annulus in patients with mitral valve annulus calcification. And I can tell you that there is no hard and fast rule. You are only using these perimeter and annulus measurements as a guide to give you an approximation of what valve size you're going to use if you're using a balloon expandable valve like a Sapien. So in this case, this patient would have been suitable for a 29 millimeter valve, whether or not I'd taken it on the inner boundary of the mitral valve annulus calcification or within a couple of millimeters, which is my standard practice to account for the blooming artifact, it doesn't influence the actual valve size that you're going to put in. 
where possible, you will put in the largest valve that you can in a Mac case, and that is purely to prevent device migration and also to prevent power valve a leak, which is often a concern. So the two considerations will be is number one, put in the largest valve that you think that annulus will take without compromising the neoleft ventricular outflow tract area. So based on those images, uh, we could probably take an audience vote. Uh, is that okay? Nick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so let's take an audience vote, and, and don't be shy. This makes it nice and interactive. Who thinks that that patient would be suitable for a valve in Mac case? And did we proceed? So hands up. Okay. So we have four people in the audience who felt that this case would be suitable for a valve in Mac case. How many people question. think that it wouldn't be suitable for a valve in Mac case? Okay. Yeah. So an equal wouldn't. number. And how many people think we can't tell, we need more information? Okay. So now let's ask our experts. So we've got uh, three of the world's experts on the, on the stage at the moment. Uh, so we've got uh, Laura, Nico, and Nick. So Laura... What would be your take on this case that I've shown you on the CT? Okay, in this case, I, need, uh, I think that it's very important just to know what will be the new LVOT, because I saw that the basal septum was quite thick, and also the valve was very oval. So you, have, like, you can have the problem that if you push a lot with a valve that it's the biggest that you can, you can have an obstruction of the LVOT. So I think that you need to, to try to have a, a simulation with the CT of what will be the, the new LVOT. Nico? Yeah, so I would like to know what the percent oversizing is based on the traditional use of area for a sapien. <clears throat> Um, because the oversizing we calculate for transcatheter aortic valve implantation is an oversizing that happens at the annular level. Now, the anchoring for TAVI happens upstairs. It happens across the calcified leaflets. And so if the, ca if the anchoring happens across the calcified leaflets, we, we figured out that depending on what prosthesis, there's almost about a 2.5 time increase in compression of the frame in the leaflets compared to the annular area. So this is why you get 0% oversizing with some sapien valves at the annulus, but you're still okay because the anchoring is happening upstairs. It happens especially with bicuspid valves. So um, going back to this patient, um, you know, I'd want to, to make sure that I have good anchoring. Um, I would take the so first of all, do not use the current guidelines for TAVI in MAC because it's not going to work. Uh, second, I use about 2 to 2.5 times uh, oversizing principle, knowing that transcatheter valves are usually having 2 to 2.5 oversizing more at the annular level, and that's what's probably anchoring our TAVI valves and sealing. Okay, so let me show you what the materialized analysts uh, uh, told us about whether or not this patient was suitable for a VIMAC. If we could play the video, please. Okay, so similar to the previous case, so th this software allows us to do automatic segmentation of the calcification. It's a one-spot click, so we've clicked over the calcium, and that's going to pull out the calcium and also give us the derived area. Uh, now, based on the area that we've got, we will select a specific device size, and in this case, given the size of the annulus area, we elected to virtually implant a 29 millimeter uh, sapien valve. Um, and you can see here that we can do some minor adjustments uh, on the 3D image just to make sure that we're getting a good overall uh, sizing of the mitral valve annulus calcification. Now, one of the things that's become very in vogue at the moment is also the derivation of the Guerrero score. Uh, and you'll note that this takes into account the circumferentiality of the mitral valve annulus calcification. It takes the height of the calcification into the left atrium and the left ventricle, and also the radial thickness of the calcification. Now, if you have a max score above six or seven, then the risk of device embolization or paravalvular regurgitation is quite low. Now, the advantage of this software as well is that not only can it give you the automated uh, Guerrero score to look to see whether or not this patient is suitable, but it also gives you the automated neoleft ventricular outflow tract area. Now, once we see the neoleft ventricular outflow tract area, you'll see that actually the neoleft ventricular outflow tract area was exceptionally small in this case. 
So there would be no way, even if this patient had circumferential calcification in the context of a small LV cavity, that we would be able to implant a 29 millimeter sapien, even if it was overexpanded by four to five mils, without inducing outflow tract obstruction. So really, by using sophisticated tools, it gives you that further refinement, it gives you that further assurance as to whether or not it is safe to proceed uh, with a procedure. And all of this can occur within about sort of eight to 10 minutes of using a single phase CT scan. So what's gonna happen now is you're going to see the neo-left ventricular outflow tract area. And you can see that the neo-left ventricular outflow tract area was very small in this case. And that was independent of the height of deployment. So here you can see the neo-left ventricular outflow tract area is very, very small. This patient would have developed neo-left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Now, we would also do exactly the same thing that we've done on the previous case that I've demonstrated, is also plan for a potential transeptal puncture. Um, we know that even though we've completed the analysis and this patient isn't suitable, that it only takes now a few extra steps to actually get the transeptal punctual data. And this is just the proof in the pudding. We can see that the patient had a very large uh, mitral valve annulus area, and actually the neo-left ventricular outflow tract area would have been about 210 millimeters squared. That's without overexpansion of the Sapien 3 device. Once you add an expansion, this is going to be less than 180 millimeters squared, high risk of neo-left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. The valve is sitting on the infraceptum and is going to be problematic. So I'm going to stop there because of time, and I'm running a little bit behind, and we'll go back to Nico and Nick to continue the session. Yeah, thank, thank you, Renak. But I think what, what we can learn from this, uh, this first part that is crucial is how uh, this kind of accurate pre-interventional uh, planning with the uh, uh, comprehensive CT scan analysis can transform your procedure because it can, it can lead you either to a contraindication or to a change of device. Uh, in mine, for example, we were dating between 26, 29, or here also you, you, gave, uh, you gave us this example. So I think we can now come back to our, our case, the, the lady I've presented. And, uh, and, sh and, and show and, and see together how this patient was treated before to come back to, uh, to a, a last round of discussion about uh, these procedures. So, welcome to Clinic Pasteur for uh, this transcatheter mitral valve in valve case. Uh, we've just discussed together the, the baseline clinical characteristic, the imaging that uh, we've, uh, we've reviewed. Uh, this case will be guided by transesophageal echography by our colleague, Dr. Lepage. And the patient, of course, for that reason, is under general anesthesia and under the care of uh, Dr. Bertolo. Um, I think without further waiting, Didier, we can yeah. briefly review what we have done so far. So, um, as I mentioned, the patient is under general anesthesia to benefit from uh, transesophageal echography guidance. Um, on the right groin, we have already positioned uh, um, the, the sheath of a uh, transcatheter valve we will implant that is uh, an Edwards 29 millimeter according to the sizing we've reviewed. We have a small arterial line just to monitor the arterial pressure and, and to take uh, blood samples to monitor the ACT. Okay, good. So let's start with the first step that is the, the transeptal puncture. Yep. Uh, for that, we will proceed with uh, the regular uh, tools, I, I would say. Huh? So what I've done is just already position uh, a sheath inside the superior vena cava. And it's important now that you have under your screen the, the X-ray image. Uh, so you're going, to, you're going to, to have it in a few seconds. And I think one first thing we can comment um, is that the, this uh, surgical mitral prosthesis we had to treat today has a very specific and I would say tricky uh, radiopaque uh, landmarks but are very, very small, huh? as you see, Didier. Um, those three radiopaque dots that you have at the ventricular uh, uh, um, um, border of the, the surgical frame. And the difficulty with such, uh, such processes is that you don't have visual obvious landmarks to um, tell you where is the, the basal annulus yep. of, a, of a mitral. And that's where I think the, the fusion yeah, imaging can, can add a lot. You see, I'm just making my pullback movement from the superior vena cava to my, my target. So a few words about that here. Um, what we've done is also on the fusion uh, locate an area where we should have a, a, a good position to enter the septum. But as we have a chance to have TOE, we'll also have a guidance from TOE. 
here, as compared to other procedures, I would say the idea is to be far enough from the mitral annulus plane, so quite uh, um, good uh, a posterior position, yep. but to be a little bit inferior also, uh, having in mind that it will give us afterwards, I think, a quite straightforward and direct trajectory coming from the inferior vena cava through the uh, left atrium and the mitral valve. Uh, that will be the easiest for for us to negotiate. Okay. So, that's where we have located uh, in a, in a fusion the area where we want to make the puncture. And so that that is a small circle that we see. Yeah, exactly. That is your and uh, um, transeptal puncture yeah. ideal site. Yeah. And regarding the 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 leads of the pacemaker, as you see, as I'm putting back, I don't see at the current time any particular difficulties with them. So probably I I will. No, don't pay attention to that. Yeah, we'll we'll take care about that, of course, at the time of entering the valve to be sure not to to be entangled. But at the moment, it's okay. So here you see, I'm quite close to my uh, location um, targeted by the, the fusion in the CT, and at the same time, you have a, a, um, a bikeval view of a TOE showing that we have a quite inferior position. So that is good to me. Maybe Laurent, you can go to a short axis view. Yeah, and we are not too posterior, so I think I, I could go a little bit more posterior. And here, I think it's good. Huh? Yeah, it's really interesting to uh, to see the correlation and uh, how uh, quite predictive it can be that CT fusion just to uh, drive you towards the, uh, the appropriate location. Yeah, so I've done the puncture, as you see. Yeah. So as soon as we, we do that, we provide the patient with some heparin. Uh, so we'll do uh, so 5,000 units for this patient and we'll target an ACT around uh, 300. The next step is to use uh, this kind of deflectable catheter in order to be able to cross uh, the, the mitral uh, valve with enough uh, backup support. Okay. So what I propose is that we, we come back to the view uh, that reflects the mo uh, most appropriately uh, the location of the ring of the bioprosthesis. As you can see, this is yeah. a RAO43 uh, angulation. Yeah. And once again, with that fusion imaging, uh, potentially the ability to uh, uh, simplify the procedure to guide uh, more precisely the, the procedure uh, could be improved. Yeah. Because we once again, we don't see the basal ring of the failed yeah. bioprosthesis. So as we mentioned, this, uh, this capture is deflect, is steerable. Huh? So you, by just uh, turning this wheel, uh, you can steer and uh, orient the capture. And one simple uh, tip to to uh, improve our chance to cross is that you see here we are in a perpendicular view as compared to the uh, basal uh, mitral uh, uh, annulus. Yeah. Uh, materialized by this uh, yellow circle. And you see at the tip of my uh, uh, steerable capture, I have also a radiopaque circle. So I just have to turn it in order to see this circle as a line telling me that uh, I'm perpendicular to uh, to my plane of uh, mitral uh, annulus and make my attempt to cross in that plane. And uh, most of the time it uh, it should work. So I, I so it's you... very interesting. Yeah. It's more um, uh, towards, it's uh, the same philosophy as, as the double S curve uh, um, technique that is provided by uh, Nico Piazza. You see, uh, the idea is uh, to align, to put in both planes, the tip of the catheter and the basal ring. And this yeah. way, if you have both lines uh, appearing, both rings appearing like a line, you are in, uh, in two uh, orthogonal planes, yeah. sorry. So here, Didier, I think small technical comments uh, because we all faced at least once during those kind of procedures, a first difficulty that is to position the stiff wire from uh, this uh, steerable catheter to uh, the left ventricle. Yep. So initially, for example, we I, I tried to do that with a conventional small pigtail, seven French pigtail. And what happened to me is that as soon as I entered with a safari, I was ejected from the left yeah. ventricle. So that's why now um, I have changed my, uh, my uh, technique. And I, I use most of the time uh, in first intention, an 8 French JF4 guiding capture that uh, provides us with more support in order to deliver this safari wire into the left ventricle. And you see by doing this, uh, most of the time, 
we have enough support. Maybe we can we yeah, can okay. work on the on the um, the position here. But this is a very uh, nice trick that you shared with us, Nico, because definitely uh, getting enough support, being able to extrude the safari. It's a safari small here. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it is a challenge, and um, I have to say that I really like your uh, tip of a eight French uh, guiding cafe too. So, so here, next step, Didier. So here is the balloon. So we've selected the balloon just to predilate the, the septum. It's going to be a, a 14 millimeter balloon, uh, just to make sure that we have uh, enough room to advance the yeah. uh, uh, the sepian free uh, device. And maybe Laurent, you can show us the the interatrial septum in uh, the view you, you want, either short axis or a bicable. No, this one is good. Just to confirm that uh, the balloon the balloon is uh, really across the uh, interatrial septum. It looks like yeah, it, it yeah. seems to be to be in appropriate position. And what I really like to do in these cases is to go for a gentle inflation, just to locate uh, the the waist on the balloon. Yeah, and uh, only it is. we can see it. Yeah. And I like to apply a more prolonged inflation because sometimes you have recoil from the septum. Yeah, just to make sure that you have enough dilation. So it's we are about eight to ten uh, atmospheres. So nothing uh, extremely aggressive, but more a gentle and prolonged predilation of the yeah. septum, just to keep it open uh, for the uh, THV. And sometimes I also make some small push and pull movements uh, across the septum with the balloon inflated in order to really, really stretch it. Okay. So I think that's good. Yeah. So we can proceed with the alignment now. Okay, so Nico, so let's do it uh, here. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, try to pull back the balloon. So we have to pay attention to keep the wire into position. So I gradually push it back to keep it into the left ventricle. And even for the fine tuning alignment, I keep the wire in place, pushing on it on a regular basis. So here we are. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so now let's come back to uh, our objective, that is to uh, cross the septum and then the valve. So I think, Didier, you can start to steer a yeah. little bit the cafeter. And basically what we do in such procedure is, is just to adapt the level of steering to what the, the, the stiff wire asks. Exactly. In other words, you, you just follow the, the stiff wire. So here you see we are across the septum yeah, yeah. and located directly towards uh, the post, one of the posts. Yeah. So maybe we have to work a little bit. Uh, each time I go back, Didier, I let you compensate yeah, for yeah, the for your position. So you see it's a um, uh, okay. collaborative maneuver between the two operators. So maybe let me withdraw the the, 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 the flex. flex. Yeah, yeah, just to cross the septum. Yeah, just to cross it and we will have to... To maybe get a better push. Okay, I think it's better now. Yeah. It's and if you pull slightly on the, on the wire, on the stiff, let's see if we cross. Okay. okay. It's so we're engaging me, a little okay. bit. Okay, so let me flex now. Yes. You and see, that's so it. uh, it's always uh, you have. We have to work with the yeah. flex and the. Um, so very, I think, uh, interesting uh, uh, observation here. First, mm. the collaboration between the two operators. Yeah, definitely. Uh, to keep the wire in place and to have a proper uh, the proper position. Second, the, the need maybe not to flex too much to in order to avoid to lose a pushability in order to cross the septum. Why it exactly. is difficult? Because the valve here is not protected by any sheath. Yep. So you have a direct friction of the frame of the valve across the septum. And once you have uh, crossed the septum, then you can add some flex and just follow the, your stiff wire that drives you towards the correct uh, location. Exactly. So uh, you're preparing the uh, direct wire pacing yeah. system. So the same uh, that we usually uh, uh, use yeah. during our TAVI procedures. So Didier, we added now on our fusion uh, vision, yeah. uh, the ideal location of the valve once deployed. Um, basically, we can summarize that by the fact that what we want is to have on the ventricular side, uh, the, the, the frame of uh, sapien free uh, located around uh, the level of uh, radio opaque uh, landmarks that yeah. we have. And meaning, in other words, that we have maybe one-fifth 
of uh, of uh, sapien valve that will be in the atrial yeah. side. This is, I, I think, our ideal uh, ideal location, I would say. And uh, in order to uh, to target this uh, this position, how would you how would you position initially, Didier? So I guess we need to uh, slightly back the bioprocesses. So what okay. I'm going to do while you're doing so is to keep the wire into position. So okay. slightly pushing the wire, and so keeping the top of the stand frame close to the to, uh, the highlights okay. uh, should uh, provide us an appropriate position. So. Uh, there is that discrepancy between the uh, highlights and uh, the uh, the S3, the mm -hmm. stent of the S3. Uh, that's something that we uh, may work on a bit, uh, keeping uh, play, playing with the wire and then the, the catheter, oh, yeah. just to be a bit more perpendicular. Okay. Is it something that sometimes you can improve by um, um, pulling... A little bit more again the the pusher, the pusher in order to have yeah. a less rigid uh, exactly. part in the in the atrium, and now if you push on the stiff wire, and if I push also on my side, we are more coaxial. As yes, it's going to be a good uh, way to start, and uh, we're going to see during the deployment. The yeah. most, imp most important is to go very slowly. Yeah, this way we may uh, reposition everything. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just position my right end. At the distal tip of a calf trip, pushing on the on the safari in order to have a stable reference in the left ventricle, and with the other hand, I'm holding the delivery capture in case I have to make uh, either advancements or pullback uh, maneuvers. Yeah. So you're going to adjust during deployment, and, yeah. we, uh, and I'm going uh, to inflate very slowly. So let's go for 180 pacing on. Okay. okay. It's, so, uh, it's good regarding the, the the capture and the pressure. Okay. So, okay, so, so you can start yeah. very gently. Currently, I'm pushing on the stiff wire in order to prevent from diving into the ventricle. So position is stable. Okay. So I'm uh, okay. So let me fully inflate. Yeah. Deflation. Okay. And pacing off. Pacing Thank off. You. Okay, so this is our our deployment uh, sequence. Maybe let's spend let's uh, review that. Yeah, a few seconds to review that. Now, commenting that very very slow deployment. Mm -hmm. First operator to maintain the, a strong push on the stiff wire in order to hold the position in place, and you put maximum volume. Yeah. And we see, as compared to our initial target with uh, the fusion, that our positioning, I think, looks good. Maybe before to withdraw the balloon and to uh, confirm that everything is okay, what we used to do sometimes is to, to add one or two cc and to post dilate and to post dilate in order to to flare the the ventricular part of the sapien valve. Um, in order to improve uh, the, the the correct deployment into this mitral uh, mitral position. Okay, so no obvious conduction disturbance and the patient has a pacemaker, so we can yeah. withdraw the balloon. Nico, if you agree. Yeah. I'm inflexing a little bit. Yeah. And it will allow uh, Laurent now to assess the, the outcome. We still have a safari inside, huh, Didier? Yeah. But uh, we're going to, to withdraw it with a, a pigtail capture in a few seconds, but... Now I think what is important for you is to have the echo images under your eyes. Yeah, and Laurent, maybe you can comment on the on the outcome. Peak, peak. Okay, so the valve is in good position. You can see the new leaflets. Using color Doppler, there is absolutely no regurgitation. There is a trace uh, inside the, the valve, but no perivalvular regurgitation. Okay, now we, we don't have any, any wire okay. anymore. Eh? Laurent inside. Okay, mean gradient is low. Two millimeters of mercury. So for the valve, I think it's a very good result. Huh? Yeah, really good implantation, good position, no regurgitation. 
And we we'll take on la fusion. We're trying so, to see on the LVOT view if we have obstruction, but in color Doppler for the moment there is nothing. Yeah. Hemodynamically speaking, uh, neither. Huh? We have a so it's very fine. good hemodynamic situation. Okay, thank you, Laurent, for, for this uh, beautiful uh, guidance and, uh, and imaging. Maybe now a few words, Didier, uh, come back to uh, what we have uh, under X-ray and the fusion, because I think it's really uh, nice and, and important to comment on what we obtained. Uh, because the help of this uh, fusion imaging, and you can see if I record that, you can see the, the final position of the valve as compared to what was anticipated and, and uh, guided, I would say, by, by the fusion. Yeah, definitely. And it's, uh, it's quite nicely superimposed. Uh, the prediction, predicted uh, positioning with the uh, fusion imaging, CT fusion, it was quite accurate. Uh, and we can see uh, awesome. clearly that the location of the top of the, the sapient free is nicely related to the, uh, the location of the highlight. So, and what I also Same like side, is huh? the, uh, the way it flares uh, when it's uh, constrained by the, uh, the, the ring, the analysis, uh metallic ring of the uh, uh, failed bioprocessor. So it's, it's quite interesting. Maybe also last, um, last word about what can... Uh, the, the advanced uh, imaging solution can add to our understanding of those procedures and guidance. Uh, Laurent, you can also show us now some images of fusion of the, the CT, CT and, and the live echo. echo. Okay, so this is the result with the fusion of the valve implanted with the CT performed before. You will have to look on the right part of the screen and you have here the LVOT view with CT scan and the uh, live 3D uh, TEE of the implanted valve. I want just to show you that uh, with the LVOT view, we can see the valve and the hand of the valve is just right there of the stent. And this is the LVOT, new LVOT. So we can think that there is no LVOT obstruction. Good, thank you, Laurent. And we perfectly see with this uh, advanced uh, imaging that uh, the final position of the valve is um, by this guidance quite accurate because it's where we, we wanted it to be inside the, the surgical valve. And Nico, congratulations for this case. And um, we hope uh, here that you will uh, uh, have a quite uh, important discussion about uh, how to implement this type of procedure in your daily practice for your patients. So before to discuss about uh, the additional value, I, I would like just to share with you a few data about the follow-up of that patient. Uh, and now if you can come back to my initial uh, presentation, the patient, yeah, thank you. Uh, so the, as, I, um, as I was mentioning, the, the patient did well. It was, she was discharged uh, with, without any particular event. The transthoracic echo uh, um, uh, control was good, as you see. But what is more interesting, because as I mentioned here today, the focus is um, to uh, uh, discuss about the value of this pre-procedural planning and peri-procedural planning, is that we did a 30-day follow-up CT scan to that patient. And you have here superimposed in red the pre-operative reconstruction, three-dimensional, in blue the, the post-operative data. And you have also the uh, uh, predicted implanted valve and the real observed implanted valve. And uh, I was really, really surprised to see that how accurate the superimposition was between two. And was also, what was also uh, very interesting to my opinion was the comparison uh, here between the predicted and the observed uh, new LVOT we had in that case. Again, it was not a high risk case of LVOT obstruction, but uh, I think for me, it was a, a clear post-interventional validation of the value of this prayer procedural planning. So now I think we, we can discuss, of course, if you have any questions about, about that, we'll be happy to, to answer to that. But uh, uh, Laura, maybe um, while waiting for, for questions, at the end of the live case, we briefly discussed about the value, potential value of CT fusion with ECHO. It's still under investigation, but uh, maybe you can tell a little bit more about that. To share with you some images of this new technique. 
So the problem now is that now we have so many techniques that we are doing in the cath lab, and we have uh, to increase how we can accurate guide these new uh, devices that are coming, and everything is going com more and more complicated, so we can choose which uh, kind of um, guidance we are going to do. We can do it only with CT, we can uh, do it with the fluoro and the CT fuse, as we saw in this uh, nice case, but now we can also fuse the CT with the TE, and it can have an added value for our patients. As you can see here, we try this new technique with some patients with recuspid. We didn't try it for the moment for mitral valve in valve. And as you can see here in the upper part, uh, you can nicely see if the CT scan and uh, the predicted annulus in the CT scan and the annulus that you have during the intervention, for example, for cardioban is the same, or maybe with the directed treatment, it's uh, smaller. We already see that during the intervention, we can, uh, sorry, we can have the information of the CT at the same time that the, we are doing the intervention, and we can have all the planes that we are seeing in the NPRs with the CT fused with the echo. So for the moment, we try uh, with the cardioban, and uh, we were not able just to put the uh, anchors in every uh, predicted spot, because as you can see here, we can fuse not only the normal CT scan, we can fuse the CT scan with the three-dimensional uh, planning. So it's important, because if you have this previous planning, you can try to get the exact same spot as planet. For the cardioban, we are still in the initial learning curve, so we were just trying to play a little bit with the new uh, this new tool, but you can see here how we can also see nicely how is the reduction of the annulus, as you can see in this part of the imaging, of the uh, tricuspid annulus after the cardioban implementation. We already use it for the valve in valve in uh, aortic position because, as you will know, sometimes uh, you need to do a basilica uh, procedure just to avoid the, uh, to have a problem with the uh, left main. And uh, with the native valve, it used to be more or less easy to see in the echo, but uh, when you have a valve in valve, sometimes it's not so easy to know where is the left mine. And as you can see here, we just make a fusion of this city. We located the uh, left mine in the plane of the city, and we, you, we are sure that if we have cut in the, with the blue uh, line, as you can see here in the uh, bottom, uh, we are cutting exactly where the oversized. So that's, that's, uh, that was the driver of our choice. Just as a, a follow-up, what did the, val uh, the mitral, valve and, uh, val mitral valve and valve app suggest? Uh, it was uh, either 26 or 29. Or 29. Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay, there was another uh, question from someone on site uh, by Gabra. Yeah. Uh, did you use Lampoon procedure? Uh, which one has better outcome, I, I assume, with or without Lampoon? Uh, no, I, I, we never had uh, and it's funny because we have quite a high volume uh, activity, but we never had really to, to use the Lampoon procedure in our experience in TMVR. That is, to be honest, uh, as a lower volume than TAVI, for, uh, to, be, to be sure. Uh, so I, I just have uh, an opinion, having seen what is Lampoon and whatever, what have been done in other cases. The only request I have at the moment as an operator maybe willing to, to implement that in my practice is to ask for a little bit more standardization maybe. And that's where I think new devices like the shortcuts will, uh, will improve and will add. And I think uh, Leonard Conradi showed in the main arena today a, a beautiful case of Tendine in, uh, in, a, in a native mitral valve uh, splitting the uh, AML with a, a shortcut device. Maybe uh, before to, uh, to close and, and to make me uh, other comments, I would like, if you can come back to my initial presentation, to, to uh, show you a, a last uh, image, because um, following up again on what you said, Nico, about the, the limitation of fusion, I think here, uh, uh, learning, from, uh, yeah, sorry. learning from that case, uh, it's true that what it added to our procedure was, I think, more uh, predictability, more accuracy. But uh, in, in other uh, fields, for example, TAVI field, I think the, the, the clear limitation at the current time is the lack of uh, dynamic fusion. And it's true that when you want to be accurate at uh, one millimeter or two millimeter margin, 
having the hard beats and the hard movements can be a serious limitation. So you have under your eyes here uh, extracted and post-processed. Of course, it's not dynamic during the live case, but it will be for, for sure in the near future. You have here an example of uh, dynamic fusion. Uh, done, uh, yeah, uh, no, no, um, uh, CT and, uh, and X-ray fusion. Okay. So the same, uh, the same kind of, uh, of uh, CT and X-ray fusion we used in the live case, but here in dynamic fusion, um, making us, I think, uh, hope that we will have this solution in the near future to guide us. And, uh, and then I think we will have uh, gone a, a step further in, uh, in the way it can help in, uh, in our procedure. Yeah. So I, I think uh, it's time now maybe to wrap up and, uh, and to, to close this session. First, I, I would like maybe to, uh, to thank General Electric and uh, Materialize who supported and sponsored this, uh, this session and, uh, and uh, helped us to build that. Uh, the main message I, I, will, uh, I will keep from that is to really, really highlight the importance uh, of pre-procedural planning, uh, of a comprehensive CT analysis, and Ronak showed us a very beautiful example coming from the, the basics, the simple things, and coming to more advanced uh, uh, assessment, but as you've shown, more advanced that is totally uh, uh, accessible and feasible by any of us, I think, yeah. uh, Ronak. And we've seen after afterwards uh, uh, how those new imaging modality can also help us uh, in, in the guidance of a procedure, and at the end, I think uh, uh, in the in the accuracy of the positioning and in the in the in the quality of the outcome for our patient, because here you saw how accurate was the placement of the valve as compared to what was predicted and uh, what what we as a, uh, as a guidance. So, last, I want to thank you uh, for spending time to to stay with us for this last session of the day, uh, a long day. So uh, ho enjoy your dinner, enjoy your night, and, uh, and see you tomorrow for the second day of PCL London Valve. Thank you very much.